Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David James. Um, I'm here to talk to you uh, about lean software development. Um, if you want to catch me on Twitter, that's my handle. Um, a little bit about me. I currently work for, I founded TotalCarCheck.co.uk. Um, it's a, a company that helps people find the uh, history of a vehicle before we go to buy it. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about that right at the end. Um, what is lean software development? Um, if you go back to its, its genesis, you'll probably, some of, the room, some of you in the room will probably be aware that, that, that the word lean probably come, is most associated with the, with the Toyota uh, production system, which in the 1980s, for a bit of historical context, was um, considered um, excellent in terms of the quality they're producing, the, the costs that they were able to reduce, uh, they had uh, longer lasting vehicles with lower defects, um, but it was specifically um, measured around uh, manufacturing processes. So <clears throat> people have tried to adapt those and distill those into software development, and today I just hope to be able to show you uh, how that might be done. Um, I like the beautiful simplicity of what they call the Toyota way. It just has two principles, which you can see there. Continuous improvement, uh, which may be referred to as Kaizen, and respect for people. Um, if you do find this topic interesting, um, I can recommend the book by uh, Mary, Mary and Tom Poppendick, which I have a copy of here. Um, it's great as a reference um, for um, what I'm about to discuss. So there are seven main principles um, which I'm going to go through with you today, trying to give you some goals and, and, and some um, examples of these. Um, Eliminate waste. So this is probably the most important, I would say, principle of, of lean um, software development and probably lean manufacturing as well. Um, it's to try and find things that are in your process or your practices that don't add any value at all. It can be both cathartic and difficult to do this because identifying waste is actually quite difficult. Um, waste exists in parts of the process and practices that we all do in things that we wouldn't normally associate with waste. Um, I've got a little checklist here that I use to go through what we do um, at Total Car Check to see if we are producing waste or we are doing anything that isn't being used properly. So the first thing I ask is, is what, is what we're doing adding any value to, to what we're doing? Um, or is it a very low value? Um, some things that are low value are important, so you mustn't just dis disregard them. But the real, um, the, the real barometer test for me is what would happen if we got rid of it completely? Um, would the world end? Um, are we doing things more than once? A big form of waste is repetition. Um, often uh, in processes, repetition can be hidden. So it's, it's important to get everything you do out into the open to try and find if you're doing things more, more than once. And probably the one I think probably affects people the most and is probably the least identified is, is mental waste. Um, so things that we're worried about, um, things that we are measuring all the time, analysing, or give us a sense of distress. Um, what can we do to either remove that completely or placate those feelings to make it easier for us to improve? So the goal is to remove anything that doesn't have a net positive value. And I'll give a couple of examples here. So in our test suite, we had some UI tests that everybody ignored because they often broke and were very fragile. In the end, we deleted them all, replaced them with something else. Amplify learning is the next uh, principle. Um, for those of you that, that are involved and, and are using agile software de delivery, which I suspect is a lot of you, you'll be already used to this. Um, learning comes from an iterative cycle of feedback with the customer um, to the team and involving everybody in the team as possible. Getting your team as close to the uh, customer as possible is really important. Um, what we try and avoid is uh, silos of information. Um, and what we try and do is reintegrate any knowledge that we have back into the team. The example I give here is what we referred to in one of the teams I was part of as brown bags because you could bring your lunch along, but you can do them as part of your, of your, of your daily process. It's, it's not a, a meeting in the traditional sense. It's more of a presentation to the team. If you learn something about uh, the product, the customer, the process, to try and feed that back in a short, uh, maybe 10 or 15 minute um, way. I decide as late as possible. Probably my favourite one, if you can have a favourite principle. Um, um, it's not a license to be irresponsible, but what it does do is it gives you the flexibility to change your mind as easily as possible. I think often in software we sometimes decide 
make decisions up front because we feel as though we need a clear way forward. And that's fine. Some decisions have to be made. The database vendor that we're going to be using, for example. Um, however, I think it's really important that you try and delay as many decisions as, as is reasonably possible to give you the biggest flexibility to change. The, the um, comparison in manufacturing um, in Toyota was um, if they bent the metal too early in the process and then found out later on that there was something needed to change, they would have to throw the whole thing away, which goes back to the first principle, which is trying to eliminate um, waste. Deliver as fast as possible. Again, uh, as part of uh, the iterative cycle of agile software delivery, you're probably used to doing this, splitting work into, into small chunks. Um, those of you that attended uh, Ian Cooper's um, uh, session this morning will have heard about you know, microservices, so making people be able to deploy their code independently of other teams means you can move much, fa much faster. Um, to facilitate this, there are things that they call information radiators, so parts that can uh, show people where you are, where you're going, uh, what you're doing. I always encourage people to, to, be, to over communicate, which is a word I don't, I don't think has a lot of meaning, but what, what I'm trying to tell people is um, you can never, there's always information inside my head or someone else's head that everybody else needs to know. Um, empower the team, super important. I think um, this underlies all of the principles because without this one, you can't really do any of the other ones. Um, uh, Trusting your team to be responsible for what they do and be independent in how they act um, is really important. Um, I think purpose probably drives all of this, and I think it's important that you constantly reaffirm what your purpose is, if, if it's a product or service, so that everyone's aligned onto what you're trying to achieve. I think it of, often increases buy-in from everybody if everyone understands what the end goal is. Um, I think giving the team full access to customers is super important. Without that, it's very difficult to um, build a product that's going to be fit for purpose. Um, but it never ceases to amaze me the amount of organisations that I see and work with where the customer is so far removed from the product or service that they're making that they can't have any direct impact. Um, one tip I give to people is, we run a, a small to medium-sized firm, is to try and get um, uh, 10 or five to ten customers that you speak to regularly um, and use them as your sounding board. Um, email them when you've got a new product idea. Um, they'll often get back to you and tell you it's terrible. You have to use your own uh, vision as well. But um, I think it's worked really well for us. What you really want, the goal here, is to, is to have self-managing individuals um, that, that can affect, and that's really important, affect change directly. If people don't feel empowered to make the difference, then they probably won't be able to. An example I give there, yeah, giving people a license to do things that might not always work out is a great example of how you've given someone uh, the power to do that. Building integrity in. Uh, probably the most difficult one to describe, um, as it's a slightly abstract concept, but if you think it's at a very high level, it's really about building the right product for your market. Sometimes, this fits quite well into the next principle, which is called see the whole, so always being aware of the bigger picture. Um, there are two types of integrity that, that make this up. The perceived integrity is that if you were to put on the, the, the glasses of the customer and to see your product, um, what would they think about it? Um, is, are there any incongruent parts? And the conceptual integrity, the product or service as a whole, does it work in a cohesive manner? Does it make sense? There can be some difficult choices when, when you're making a product uh, to build integrity in, but I think, um, I think you, you understand when integrity is there when people think that your product gets the problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, the last principle is, uh, is see the whole. Um, I think this is more about maybe not micro-optimising and micro-managing the processes, um, which you might think is slightly ironic because of this, the, the, the six previous principles, and there's lots to consider. But as a concrete example, um, the Tour de France winner will rarely win more than one or two of the stages. If they try to optimise to win all of the stages, they probably will never win the Tour de France due to fatigue. So if you just focus on the individual stages of the Tour de France, you're unlikely to find out who the winner is. Um, this, is this is, in my opinion, this is easier to do if you step back regularly, do things like retrospectives in the agile sense, <clears throat> and try to refocus people on your purpose as much as you can. 
Uh, I quite like the, the phrase, uh, think big, act small. I think it summarizes this quite well. That was it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, tomorrow I have another talk. This is shameless self-promotion on, uh, on turning a side project into a business uh, where I'll uh, hopefully pass on some tips how I turned uh, a, a business that I started off the side of my desk into a, into a, a, a much larger business. Thank you very much for your time.